Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 1030th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, Programs Associate here at The Rail, and I have the huge pleasure and privilege today of being your MC for a conversation with Vic Muniz and Dan Cameron. And now it is with great excitement that I will introduce our guest and host. Vic Muniz lives and works in New York and Rio de Janeiro. He is recognized for his photographs of reimagined, largely art historical imagery, which he creates out of a wide variety of materials, from chocolate and sugar to junk and toys. He is involved in social projects that use art making as a force for change. In recognition of his contributions to education and social development, Muniz was named a UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador in 2011. In 2017, he founded Escola Virigal, offering preschool and after-school programs in art, design, and technology to children four to eight years old at the Favela Virigal in Rio. His work has been exhibited internationally. And our host today, New York-based curator, art writer, and educator Dan Cameron, launched his career in 1982 with extended sensibilities at the New Museum the first institutional effort in the U.S. to examine gay and lesbian identity in art. For over 40 years, Cameron has held senior curatorial positions at the New Museum, Orange County Museum of Art, and CAC New Orleans, and organized more than 100 museum exhibitions. In 2007, Dan founded Prospect New Orleans. His most recent book on Eisenman's, uh, Nicole Eisenman's paintings was published in 2021. Um, Vic and Dan, thank you so much for being here, and I'm thrilled to pass it over to you, Dan, to get us started. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Um, welcome to everyone, and welcome especially to Vic Muniz, Muniz who I've known really since the uh, late 80s, I believe. We've, I know. <laughs> we, we started young. Very telling. Uh, very young. Um, but the last uh, substantive conversation I had with Vic was actually in 2010 at the on the occasion of the release of his movie, Wasteland, which I'm sure many of you know, it um, was nominated for an Academy Award. Um, and it's a very, very powerful view um, into how recycling, informal recycling happens. I'm gonna just use those very few words to describe it um, in Brazil, but it reveals an aspect of Vic's worldview that I'm not sure people were all that familiar with until the film came out. And I'm just gonna loosely describe it as a form of so social justice that has to do with ecology. And, and maybe that's too broad a set of descriptives, but um, you know, because that work left such an impression on me, and I know there's a trail that leads from the wasteland up to the current work, but first I was hoping I could just double back and ask Vic a little bit about how this commitment to social issues um, in your work has kind of fired um, your studio production. Well, I guess it has a lot to do with what brings us here right now. I'm an artist, you're, you're a, a writer, and uh, I never thought I would be talking to about artwork with anybody in my life. It's not nothing that was part of my reality when I, when I was growing up. You know, I grew up in the in a favela in the outskirts of uh, Sao Paulo in a place called Jardim Panamericano. My parents didn't have art books. I've never, you know, I, I was I didn't grow up around art. And when I finally moved to New York in the early 80s, you know, and found my path not that I, I always liked art history, I, I always um, studied, I was very curious about it, and I always drew and painted. I was the, a weird creative kid in, a, in an environment that was not so um, used to that kind of thing. Uh, but I never had any ambitions to become an artist, and I, was, I thought maybe I could be at work as an illustrator for a newspaper or a magazine or something like that. Those are professions that existed at a certain time. Um, I came to New York and I started showing, realizing that I, I don't know, I, I always say then, and you were right there when this happened, uh, there is a moment that you see that all the films, all the songs, all the, you know, the, the parties you went, all the conversations you had, they start popping up in mainstream media. And you realize that, that your culture is actually becoming mainstream. It's slowly become, it's like when you, there's a good analogy in surfing, you know, when you 
you're you see the waves coming and then it's time for you to pebble so otherwise you don't catch it i felt that I, uh, until i saw i walked into a gallery i remember i had a friend who who was an artist and we used to go see galleries together in the east village it was different because the owner of the gallery was in the gallery asking for people to come in you know <laughs> like an indian restaurant when they imagine that papadum, you know <laughs> and uh it was a completely different scene and you you could have conversations with the actual owner of the gallery you know it was a uh, very receptive and informal but i remember going to see art at the time and uh a second and uh being you know i i never really felt comfortable looking going to a museum never felt that that was my place and at one point I, I i started seeing art that talked to all the things that i was really i, I like commercial art you know i studied advertising when i first walked into I, I went to this friend of mine we saw cindy sherman's work mm -hmm. nobody had to explain that to me you know that person who was in sort of a limbo between the media, all the fantastic, you know, all, all the media that the person was acquiring. That was I was that was me. I was probably the first generation of artists that uh, lived under the spell of television his entire life, <laughs> electronic visual media, you know. And uh, and I started thinking maybe I can do something, but I I didn't. I started a career here in New York, and I started it as a. I was an illegal alien when I had my first show. And until it stuck, actually, yeah, it stuck. Yeah, I remember but it. The first shows were with Collins and Milazzo back way back. Right, right. Did those little series of curated shows, you know, mm -hmm. and they introduced me to Stucks. And I was trying to become an artist, I guess, you know. Uh, now I don't have that excuse anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I. But now I, you don't need an excuse. One, it took me six years to go back to Brazil. When, when I did, and when I got my green card and could go to Brazil and could go to Europe, I was an artist and I was dealing, selling things to rich people. And it, there was a huge gap between the person I left in Brazil and the person I became. Uh, and I had a really hard time trying to put these things together. It wasn't until I, I 99... 99, yeah, that I came to Brazil to uh, for a, a show curated by uh, a woman named France Mohan. She she died a few years ago, and then she, she did, was my uh, predecessor at the new museum. Yeah, exactly, she was yeah. very interesting. She did the shows with she did one series of exhibitions with the Amish community, right? And she did this in Brazil, and it was an international exhibition. Recreate uh, Carol Walker. There was a whole group of people, uh, Janine Antoni. Uh, Chaiko Cheng, uh, Shenzhen, they're all there. And it was a residence with some Brazilian artists. And I went as an international artist. And it's, it was very interesting. But we worked with uh, homeless children, um, creating things with uh, rescued homeless children, you know, that were reintegrated with their families, had to go to school. But there were a lot of trauma stories and everything. And somehow I saw myself taking care of the child I left in Brazil before I, I, I moved from Brazil. And that was the way I found to go back to my culture, you know, to actually put these two worlds together. And I never stopped. Since that, I did uh, Wasteland was another way to actually do it. And I've been uh, actively promoting these situations, you know, I've, I've been looking for them. Ever since, I mean, the Wasteland was a was an interesting thing because I had done a, a documentary before, a little short thing about my work, and I, it was just having people follow me around, having meals with me, or you know, I couldn't work for like two years while this was happening. <laughs> Somebody puts a camera on me, I I stop working. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like mm, you know, then I'm acting, and I, right. I then it becomes self conscious. Yeah, um, and I wasn't interested in that. And this uh, uh, production company from England, they wanted to do a documentary on my work, but also talk about Brazil and all of that. I didn't want to do it until I met Lucy Walker then. And she, I, she suggested it, that we would do something about one uh, series of art, of artworks. 
And that's how I work. You know, I don't never really aim for a masterpiece or something that will resume my thinking. I, I'm, I would be afraid of such thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do, I make series of works and it, I'm comfortable with that because I, I depart from ignorance, from the fact that I don't know anything. I don't know how to work the material. Don't, the ideas are not cohesive and how do you put them against material? And I, I work slowly, getting better, better, better. And it's a curve. You know, I get better. And then at one point, I'm just doing work. I'm just working. And, I and then it's time press, to change. And then I feel gaps that, I, oh, maybe that image will look good. And, and I try to have several of these, uh, you know, curves simultaneously or at different stages so I can manage uh, my creative production. And, and then I, but this is it. I thought maybe if they come and to a, I come to a place and I'll let them film when I know nothing about it and how that develops. And that they developed beautifully because the film had so many problems mm -hmm. <laughs> with funding and directors and he went back and forth and it ended up in Lucy's hand again and she put it together. She had to stop to do another film. And he had enough time. I think this is very essential. He had like two years where we grew enormously close to uh, people who never been to a museum or a gallery or an or a auction house. And we brought them to make work with us. And they were, it was their portraits. They never, you know, most of these people weren't familiar with their own portraits either because they had this very bad telephones that they would, they would find in the garbage and take pictures of themselves. But uh, it was amazing, you know. And as I said before, I, I, I started out as a, as a, I wanted to be an artist, you know, and then, 10, 15 years later, 20 years later, you are already an artist and you don't get to, you don't have that excuse. You, you what, what is the, what is it that you do? What does it do? What it does it to what, what it does to other people? You know, that question starts becoming very pertinent, very important. And I think when I did Wasteland, um, I realized one thing that it's even now it's, it resonates uh, in, in what makes me want to make art is the fact that uh, contemporary art is something that's supposed to take people from the comfort zone, change the way of their thinking, therefore update a little bit their relationship to reality, you know, mm -hmm. contribute to that. Uh, but this is has to be good for everybody, you know, not for people who studied post-structuralism or, or people who've been to art school or, or know... Uh, um, you know, who George Didi Huberman is. And I, I don't, I, I think um, it has to be for everyone because it was for me. It changed my way of looking. And in Wasteland, what we did that was really interesting, we brought people to the studio. You see, I, I have a show up right now and, and I share my work with people, but the, once the work is done, when you bring people in to do work with you and you share the making of it. This mm -hmm. is an art form in itself that I'm I'm really, I like to explore, you know, because I'm used to work with people. Um, I don't have, you know, an army of assistants. I have a few, but sometimes it's good to have a whole bunch of people invite and, and you know, let's make it together something. It mm -hmm. uh, takes away from your um, authorship, your control. But uh, as you get older and more mature as an artist, which I think I am getting, um, you you learn how to relinquish power, you know, over the end. And, and you end up with something that, although it's not exactly what you thought it would be, it's something much bigger because it's more involving and more and more interesting. I mean, the, you're right when you said that these these some of these beginnings, they inform the production of my work consistently because... Uh, I, I have a project right now that um, maybe I didn't mention before. Maybe you don't know. I have a gallery in a market in the middle. In, in a, it's a food market in Salvador, in, in Bahia, in mm -hmm. Brazil. And I've been showing cutting edge contemporary art, you know, to a place where there's only fishermen, bars where people drink beer. <laughs> and it's, That's wonderful. It's uh, amazing because... Uh, before when I started doing this, people, oh, it's great! It's good. It's gonna bring uh, art lovers to the market. You know, it's a huge market called Feira de São Joaquim, 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I said, no, I'm not doing it for anybody from outside. I'm doing it for the people in there. And it's, a, it's an experience that is very moving and it proves that Anna, you can make, you can show contemporary art that to anybody and it will have an effect. Sometimes the effect's a little diverse, sometimes even better. Sure. It, uh, it's something, it's, this is the latest thing that I've been uh, working outside my own production of images here that I do here in the studio. But it, all these things, they feed, you know, my, my you know, it feeds my search for meaning in what I do. Mm-hmm. Do and, you think it's accurate to draw the line that I was drawing between um, what I would call the, uh, the left behind of society, people who are of the lower economic um, classes. And then this notion of recycling, the idea that, um, you know, one of the titles of your show is scraps and scraps of course is a, yeah. is also waste. And, and the idea that, you know, that there's a, I'm going to call it a class imbalance, a disequilibrium that somehow has become one of the subjects of your work, not just through the obviously socially oriented aspects, but also by the way you insist that things that have no value um, can become something of, if let's not say value, but of meaning, of deep artistic meaning, even though they started off as leftovers, as scraps of something that had no value at all. Is that an accurate observation, Vic, from your it perspective? Is, in a number of ways. I mean, I'm t- always trying to mess with the hierarchic uh, structures in when you you look at or think about an image. And I'll talk about art, you know, because I, I think I, I was lucky enough to inherit a background in commercial and advertising. I'm, I, I'm crazy about all kinds of media expressions. I'm, I, I'm not... Um, I'm talking about so much of that. I, I, whenever I make an exhibition, I'm thinking, I'm not really thinking about art. You know, whatever becomes art is not up to me. I, I mean, I'm always thinking I'm a person who makes images. And um, in the beginning, you know, there was a transmutation of uh, getting art uh, uh, historical icons into some everyday things like chocolate or. It is a way for you to sort of, you know, um, mis- displace a little bit the focus on either is the making, the technique, these things that are, for me are not that important in the end. I mean, I remember, and and but it 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 was a challenge to actually work in that way because it gives a a little facile, uh, uh, simplified uh, uh, impression of what you do. When you work with icons, archetypes, things that everybody knows, scraps, things that are you're tired of seeing. If I do it um, in in a, iconographically, you know, so I, I I pick these things intentionally because I want sure. to really tap into the the visual uh, baggage of everyone. So the more known the image, and I've done it like uh, works. One of my first works, I don't know if you recall, recall is that well, the best of life, the book that everybody has, all those Pulitzer Prize winning pictures. Um, so I I tap on that, and then I also work on things that people know, that they they eat, they 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 deal with every day. Uh, and it's very funny because people say, oh, you work with unorthodox materials. I've heard this many times. <laughs> no, nothing unorthodox about chocolate or, or caviar is unorthodox. Yeah, I work with that too. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I always say, do you know what's in paint? You know, nobody <laughs> even knows. Not the fact that in, when you make a painting, what is beautiful, you know, and, and somebody, you have to think that all those colors, they come from different parts of the world. You know, from mines, from underground caves, and or or from uh, animals. You know, and uh, I think that uh, when you make a painting, I always have this sort of like I go back uh, or a drawing. You know, uh, people don't think about this, but uh, you know, uh, I am I love mosaic because mosaic you separate the iconography, the iconography to the the materials the material that it's made. And mm-hmm. it's just by making the material a little bigger, you know. So you you if you get like a glass mosaics like you, the ones you see in Ravenna or in Sicily, you know, there's a perfect balance between the the size 
of the, the parts and the whole. Right. If they're too small, I, micro mosaic is boring because it, it's just like, and, uh, you know, if you get, a, but also if you, the parts are too big, it's, it's inaccurate and jazz. There's no appeal. It doesn't give yeah. you that feeling. But in the, when you come to think of it, you know, from micro mosaic to painting, just this fragments of pigments that are like together. Every painting is a little bit of a mosaic <laughs> in a number of ways. But uh, you don't know what's in there. They have, uh, you know, some 18th century uh, powders, you know, that they had the mummy powder, for instance, or something that people, uh, uh, those deep browns and Rembrandt paintings, you know, sometimes they come from corpses from Egypt. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. that. But you know, don't tell me sense. about chocolate, you know, that, that that is pretty deep, you know. I haven't used that. I don't think I would. Uh, <laughs> but there is a... a a, a constant uh, pair, this this idea of like trying to shift. And it may be something that later when I started working outside my practice here at the studio, I started tracing these connections too. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I, it's funny. I, I worked at the idea of peripheric, you know, like I, I, I lived in outside the city in the poor area of the city. And the periphery, it's like it touches, it's like a place close to the center. It's a, I, I always believe that the best uh, creative impulses are from that zone where uh, like uh, people are, like the need to do something, the wanting touches the possibility of something. Mm -hmm. you know, the friction. The between, desire. Yeah, between the friction between desire and possibility creates the, the right uh, energy. For, for creativity, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. uh, you can see from rap music to a lot of, and I, I, I think that I try to always go back to this area where there's a sort of ambiguity between what you want and what you can do. And uh, sometimes I try to illustrate it. Um, well, I think that comes out really clearly in the current show, for example, where you're, uh, you're working with scraps but the scraps are money. So there's a there's a there's a before and an after to the materials yeah. where first it's it's currency and then it becomes something that's more fixed in, in time and space. Here's Amelia Earhart, for example. Yeah, the, um, I think the, the the two series, you know, it's all those two curves that I was I was talking about. Um I started working with the idea of um my work sort of like um, chronicles the shift between the analog photograph images and the digital ones. And I think uh, it, there's something interesting about it. I remember when digital cameras outsold regular cameras, all my friends who were photographers, like, you know, I knew a lot of them. I used to have a magazine. They, they were like running for the hills. They're like, oh, we have to buy paper. We have to buy film. We have to do this. Because it's all disappearing, <laughs> and it is. It was much bigger than that, you know. It's just <laughs> paper. Paper is something that we used for centuries as a, as a support for not only to retain uh, ideas, you know, to hold information, but also to to spread it, you know. And uh, it it no longer serves either purpose. I mean, and I think I started out this investigation first by making these uh, mosaics with pieces of uh, magazines. We, maybe you can pull one that like the pictures of magazine. Yeah, the, uh, the zebra, the number two. Oh, or maybe number one, number one. Yeah, one before that. First, I started working with just paper, you know, like drawing paper with different colors. And I made this really insane uh, uh, collages that were, I separated the colors with the aid of the computer and I tried to put them back, trying to figure out if they hold, the, they were coherent. Um, and they are, it's incredible because when you are away, you see the Ouija uh, picture in it perfectly. Mm -hmm. And as you get close, you know, you realize that they're just triangular bits of paper. There's a good looking woman uh, on top of a guy's shoulder there with a the black, Bikini. She yeah. when you get 
when you get to see it closer, you know, if you blow it up, she looks like a monster. <laughs> <laughs> but from a distance, everything sort of comes together because what is doing it, it's your mind. Um, let's go to the next image. But started, I started thinking about paper as how important it is. I, I started, you know, when I did the, the garbage pictures, I had the, the or the chocolate pictures. It was just creating high contrast and separating what was the image, what was not. But in our minds, and I'm always trying to sort of make a picture of the way I see things in my mind, you know. We have a vast, incoherent uh, a wasteland of a, a garbage dump of images, things that we don't even pay attention to very well. And uh, when we imagine, when we picture something in our minds, we picture it very, you know, it's fuzzy, it's not fixed, it's very hard to keep it because, and the more we see images, the harder it is to actually concentrate on a single image. So. I made these pictures, they were made of pictures and there are like millions of little things that sort of distract you from seeing that zebra, which is a, a really cool, it's, it's a, also a displacement. That is a Stubbs picture um, of uh, Queen Victoria zebra, you know? And that's why it's against a green background. I, I thought it was such a beautiful thing. <laughs> I love that painting. Uh, maybe from the magazines I went to, maybe go to the next one. Um, I collected postcards, you know, and um, and I. This is something. If I say the word Paris, everybody is going to have more or less that picture or a picture of the Eiffel Tower alone. But uh, uh but in this picture that you make in your mind, this Paris-like picture, you have buildings from everywhere you've been. You just put it together. You make a montage in your mind of uh, something that is Paris-ish. You know, and this is what I was trying to construct. You know, it's funny that postcards, you know, they make no sense anymore because of Instagram and, and faster media. But the fact that I always like the fact that you send something from the place, there's some poetics about it that's really, really cool. Um, let's go to the next one. And this is, these are all images, they're very, you know, they're like they're known. The media. They're, everyone knows. Then I them. Thought of, yeah, then I thought about what about images that speak directly to you? You know, there are trillions of images of, of of people that they have died, they have lived, and they were images that were deemed uh, important. You know, I've been collecting, and I think the thing that really, uh, if I got an education in photography, was by collecting family pictures. I've been doing this for thirty years now. Other and people's I, families. Yeah, when I was a kid, my aunt. She worked at, at, in an airline. She used to take pictures of me. She took that picture. That's me, actually, when I was mm -hmm. two. And then she would take it back to Miami, where she lived, you know, and then she would come back next year for Christmas, and then she would show me the picture. I told this to my daughter. She couldn't understand. She's like, why didn't you show <laughs> you on the phone? I said, no, no, that's not the way it was. <laughs> but when I moved to the U.S., I, I came to Chicago first. I saw a garage sale, and I saw pictures being sold, I couldn't understand how the pictures were separated from their owners, how they became orphans, you know? And I started buying, I, I remember I bought like a lot, there were 10 pictures, I paid uh, like three, two dollars and two, two fifty on them. And those are the first, I still have them. I only have nine pictures of myself as a child. Hmm. And I started looking at these pictures and trying to imagine who these people were. And then you, you realize that people make mistakes when taking pictures. And now I have 250,000 pictures and they, you can buy enormous lots of it on eBay and, and, buy, and I buy uh, uh, albums too. And I, that's funny because I, I, I had dinner with Cindy Sherman in Venice when she showed her collection of albums. And then I, I, I said to her, oh God, I collect albums too. And then she said, oh, you're the one that's bid, bidding against me on the day. <laughs> it's the two of you. <laughs> yeah. Because, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, an album, it's you get the same thing. You get the baby picture, the school pictures, you know, the the Christmas and birthdays and so on. Then, and the, it's all the same story. And then they, they have kids, vacations, uh, kid, older uh, grandchildren. The only thing that changes, it stops somewhere. 
and uh, it the scenario is different, and then sometimes the 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 characters are different, but all, the story is all the same. And uh, we live now; we punctuate our lives based on the pictures we take. Um, yes. So I decided to those. I had these pictures in in envelopes, in boxes. Maybe I can cut them and bring them back to life. But I only did the most, uh, uh, you know, really, really uh, simplest. The pictures that everybody take, the baby picture, the uh, uh, the Christmas picture. That there's one that the kid just got like a bicycle, you know, like or or the Christmas tree, the new car, the house. And uh, this is uh, uh, you know, I did this in 2004. Wow, ten years already. I've been working on these things for a long time. Uh, for the next one, um, let me see. I started um, having, looking at the, working with, with a different uh, way because I I got, I'm very reluctant to accept technologies, you know. Not, normally assistants are always trying to buy new equipment, you know, and it's, it's fun. But uh, I, I didn't think about this. I, in the early 80s, I used to work directly on the surface of the images. I didn't respect photography. I wasn't a photographer then. I, I came from sculpture. But I used to mm -hmm. cut pictures as if they were objects. When I had a, a little success as a photographer, you know, I started making larger prints, and that coincided with the whole big picture thing with Thomas Roof, Andreas Gursky, and it's when I had my first exhibition at MoMA. I started making larger prints. They were expensive. And then I never touched the surface of the images again. Huh. Uh, well, it was, you know, a few years ago, in the, around 2020, 2018, I finally got an inkjet uh, print um, printer here in the studio. And I've been, like, thinking about them since I used to teach at Bard and Stephen Shaw was one of the first people who actually had a really, really close connection with inkjet printing. But I, I still thought that the images weren't sharp enough, they weren't real enough. And uh, I thought it would be amazing, you know, to have the printer and work as a painter. So you just, you print uh, and you, you, you print the picture and you work on its surface and you re-photograph it and you do it several times until the picture plane sort of gets lost. So you didn't decide to not touch the prints. It was just, it came out of the process. You found yourself. Yeah, yeah. It was, I think because it was, I didn't stop, I stopped working with the prints because of, um, it didn't make sense then. And I was like becoming a photographer, you know, and then I forgot about the surface of the, messing with the surface of the photograph is very interesting. But mm -hmm. most importantly, a photograph is this, is this hegemonic, to the dimensional space, you know, that everything happens in two dimensions in front of you. Once you re-photograph a picture, say when you put something in it, you have already two times and that messes with your perception of what you, it's in front of you. If you do it two, three, four, five times and every time you photograph, you add or take something from it or you lift something or make something a whole, uh, it really shifts what you're looking so you don't you probably seeing things that are happening weeks apart or in the, it, the 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 picture plane becomes very ambiguous in time and in, in space mm -hmm. and uh and then what i had i had this idea of not showing them as photographs but as photo objects so the pictures when you see uh, the other thing that's really cool you see i have an instagram account i never show my work in it no i noticed <laughs> because it's impossible to see it uh, these are pictures that only make sense if you go to the gallery and see them. You have to experience them physically. See, what you're seeing right now on the screen is a picture that makes no sense in relation to what's trying to represent. Uh, the, the picture has three levels and it has holes in it. And you, what, when you look at it, you get very confused about what you're looking at. And confusion mm -hmm. is good because it inspires uh, thinking and discernment. Um, this picture is specifically, you know, it's a picture that sort of is etched in, in my mind, you know, because when I first saw it, I was so so touched because I'm one person, I like explosions, you know? When I was a kid, I used to blow up things. And, and when you see it, <laughs> yeah. And then when you see it, like 
a, you know, a, a terrorist attack like this. And it, it, it's very confusing for me, you know, to, to look at it and, and, and not to imagine what was like the, 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 the power of this blast and what it did. And I, I always, I looked at this, I had, a, I had a cutout of this and I kept looking at it. And it's a horrible picture at the same time, but that to when you build something that is a scene of destruction, it's very interesting, you know, you're trying to make a picture of something that was collapsed and blasted and blown. Um, it was a, I thought I did it as a challenging, as a process. I, I really enjoyed doing this. And it was I, I, it's, it's from this series. This is how Scrap started like uh, four years ago. It's, it's this still piece. Of, yeah. This is, this is not in the show right now. It's no. because I did two exhibitions um of with this series this is the, what we have now at the gallery is a continue and these are made of things that are left over in the studio right. they are painted okay. pieces of paper that i rephotograph and and interesting enough in the show you see pieces that are in many many uh you see parts of the works they they go from one piece to another i keep reusing them mm -hmm. and i think there's something you're right there's something symbolic about the idea of recycling that keeps coming back you know you know in a strange way well this is also an image that i think um sums up the notion of the indescribable event you know i think for many people you, you know the 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 image there's the event that happened there was the explosion timothy mcveigh and his yeah and his in his part in his uh partner in crime. And, you know, that resonated in a particular way for a certain amount of time in, in the United States. And that was summed up because by we, this we, one image, but then but, something changed. And now this image is sort of floating away. In, in, well, in the I thought past. it was important to bring it back, you know, like homegrown exactly. terrorism is something that it's in, unimaginable. You know, I remember uh, looking um, you know, my dealer that just died, Brent Sikema, he had a, sure. a portrait of, of Tim McVeigh that he bought from Richard Archwagger. Wow. And uh, I, when I saw the, the portrait of Archwagger, um, I loved that, you know? I thought it was, he did, I, it was amazing, you know, that he did that portrait. But then I kept thinking that why didn't he do the scene of the explosion? You know, because in his in that when he did those in those uh, um, relief boards, you know, like it would be amazing. Uh, I can't, you know, when you look at an artist and you wish he did also something else, and and obviously he was one of my favorite artists, and he died. And this is also one of the reasons I did this piece, and it's timely. It's you know, twenty twenty. Uh, talk about homegrown terrorism is important. But also, it's it, this has become in my mind just a, a memory, and I think it's it's important to bring these things back from time. To of time. course, of course. And now it's become, you know, now we think of this in relationship to January sixth, and exactly. we realize that we've become accustomed. We're almost normalizing the idea of domestic terrorism because it's no longer rare. It's actually part of the platform of one of the major political parties right now. This is amazing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, the, the distance between the actual image and until it becomes a memory and how it could be contextualized now, it is uh, it is scary. You know, when you look at this now and you're just going, well, this was a public building and it was an it was a government building that got destroyed. Yeah, what what what's the difference, you know? Very little, I'm afraid. Um, except that here you have the symbol, as you said, you can bring it back. And you know so I, there's a certain number of people who are seeing this image or who saw this image when it first came on and went, what is that? I don't know what that is. Again, because it's more than 20 years now. Yeah, you know what I did in uh, just recently? Too bad we don't have an image, but maybe you can go, uh, you know, the viewers can go on the internet and do, do a research. I, in, we had a copycat event in Brazil but it was not January 6th, it was January, January 8th, you know, where also the public buildings, the Supreme Court got stormed by, uh, you know, radicals. Uh, they were encouraged by the, the you know, the ex-president. The outgoing guy. Yeah. 
and uh it was you know he had all the you know it was it was a, a coup d'etat it was a, a, in, in the making uh i i think it was a lot worse in in many ways because it, it people had learned from january 6 and they tried to think oh maybe we can do we can do this a little bit more organized in a way that it will bring results you know <laughs> and um and i got a call from the the senate director and she said, listen, I have all the glass, the carpet, everything that people, you know, they they urinated on top of it. That I have all this trash that was taken and, Waste. and I kept it. And, and I said, why you kept it? And she said, well, you know what? I, I was afraid because I work at the Senate for 20 years. And next day I came here, the week after, you know, the, the 8th of January, two weeks later, they had fixed everything, and I was afraid people would forget. Uh, and I wanted to know if you could help me do something about it. And I said, initially, she the suggestion was to do maybe a scene of the event that illustrated so you would hang in the Senate, right? Mm. As a reminder of how things can go, uh, um, you know, bad. And um, but then I I realized it's, it's exactly it's a, it's a it's a it was a reconstruction. I decided just to do a picture of Brasilia that I never done before, uh, with the bits and pieces. It was like a weird, sinister mosaic, you know, like so. It was an actual people. mosaic. It's a you mosaic. You used the glass, of glass. Yeah. yeah, glass, powdered glass. Uh, mm -hmm. There are fragments of like uh, uh, bombs, parts of the carpet, which is the color of the of the Senate, you know, and uh, I was. Like two months ago, I just installed it in the Senate, and it was it was quite interesting to be there and to put that there. Uh, and I I kept now that you're saying I kept thinking of how is that piece going to age, you know it's a it's a very 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 interesting uh, way of thinking. It's just mm. it's a large work and just depicts Brasilia, the Nehemiah you know complex. And Lucio Costa complex, and but it's made with all the fragments, all the bits and pieces from the attack. I mean, this is unbelievable. You know, it's funny we were talking about mosaic before. You know, it's uh, when you turn something that it's supposed to be monolithic into just fragments. Um, working in the in Gramacho, you had the impression of of how you know this. <clears throat> It it's it was very interesting how you we make things and then they slowly disintegrate they lose their form and then their matter and they go back into a natural stage in a in a garbage dump you know in a garbage dump you just see fragments of things it's a very challenging um, perceptual environment it just when you look at it it's just these bits and pieces of things that were also useful or 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 they had a definite form. Mm -hmm. You know, and your eye keeps like trying to catch uh, the logic of this, you know, fragment. It's a, maybe it's a, it's not a, a, an accident that I've become more and more involved in, with things that are fragmented after being three years, like, you know, you know, rummaging um, a, a garbage dump uh, for, you know, cont content. Uh, but it, it, it was something that definitely had an effect in the way I, I I see things. It does. It definitely has a Midas, almost alchemical aspect to it too, which is that this kind of transformation of something that society doesn't want. Society's made it very clear that we don't value this, we don't want it, and then it arrives at your front door. <laughs> and you transform it into something else, something that's actually... Yeah, have a has a lasting meaning but you know then i think uh, i always maybe because i i come from a different reality and that it's uh, every time i've done anything that was uh, somehow uh, connected to a social issue or or a group of underprivileged people every time i never did any work connected to anything remotely political or social that didn't have a capital uh, element to it uh, when you said my capital yeah, element yeah money you know oh sorry yes <laughs> yeah because when you say uh, Midas I kind of like that because <laughs> at one point 
you know, you change because you know, making art is just making uh, working on the interface between ideas and physical things. You think of something and you make you make it and it exists, you know. And it comes from the fact that you're actually looking at the physical world and internalizing it as ideas. So you just that is a two way thing. Sure. But once you realize that making things is important, but you can also make things that have a different effect on people's lives, on perhaps different people's lives. And uh, you can use the artwork as a way to promote it and to actually fund it. Uh, it is something uh, I, I never thought that, you know, selling artwork it could be such a powerful thing because you create the context for it to exist too. I give you an example. Um, the the daycare center that's right next to my house, between my house and my studio in Rio, uh, it was about to close. So the nuns came to see me because I um, I got married there uh, when Malu and I we baptized our, our daughter there. And uh, they are friends. So they came to see me, asked me if I could help they stay open until the, the, the year's end. Mm -hmm. I, I, they, I got married in the parking lot of the, sh of the, of the <laughs> because, but Malu turned it into this beautiful cathedral. It was wonderful. You know, she decorated everything and made it this beautiful place. And, uh, um, and then I, I had an idea because I had been making pictures of saints, Catholic saints. Sure. Um, I remember those. I, I really liked them because before they were superheroes, you know, Marvel and, and, they were saints, you know, they have, of course, power. they do things that, and they are at the level between what we don't understand and what we live there. They're partly human, they're like Greek gods or things. You know, sure. We love people with superpowers, you know? Uh, and I really, I learned from saints from my, my grandparents. And then, and, and I always thought I'd never differentiate them from like Spider-Man or Batman or something. I thought they were pretty much the same crowd, you know? Uh, but if I asked uh, uh, my gallerist if I can I do a like a, a show with uh, you know religious images, you know I don't think they would be very happy with that, or a museum a curator wouldn't be <laughs> that tempted to do it. Although I think it would be something quite radical. Uh, but I, then I said to the, the the nuns, maybe I can do a show with some material that I want to show for a long time. So I, with the help of the gallery in Brazil and an architect. We made this beautiful, beautiful installation of, of all these saints, St. Augustine, St. John, from very beautiful uh, sources, you know, from Tiepolo, from Caravaggio. And with the sale of the works, we managed to keep the daycare center open. It's open now. And, um, you know, every time I'm working, I hear the kids, you know, screaming, um, from at lunchtime, and I, I wouldn't bear to, like, to, to lose that noise. It's so beautiful. Uh, I, it, this is it. You know, it you can change things physically in a much wider, much larger way. Sometimes, if you if you want to, you know, with art making, mm -hmm. um, by bringing people to make it with you, it's something that is fascinating. How by bringing it to people who wouldn't be able to see it otherwise. And by creating these situations in which, and the content of what you do has to do uh, with how it affects the world, how it affects, you know, the, exactly. the, people, the people who are connected to it somehow. But um, I think uh, when you talk about social issues, you know, you have to think a little bit bigger than just illustrating uh, people's uh, uh, lives. You just, you have to help, you know, especially if, if you're, uh, um, you know, I, I have to say I'm a successful artist. You know, I, I make more than what I need, and it's a, it's a very good thing to be able to do this. Um, and I do it more and more. And there's many, many. Last time I showed um, scraps in the gallery, I showed um, a work that's called the Museum of Ashes. In, at at uh, Sikkim Jenkins and the Museum of Ashes. Oh, these are the the scraps, the install, installation. Mm -hmm. And I like I uh, also the people. This installation is probably the only show in in New York right now that there's a picture of a galaxy and a puppy. 
Uh, I want people to look at the pictures and not to think about um, a like a, a, a like a, nar a, a thematic narrative. Oh, these are pictures about this or about that. Because I'm really tired of art that's about anything. <laughs> so I uh, so you know in this picture you see at the corner is a, a, what I see from my bedroom. Um, you know, there's a forest in the back with this big big you know, tropical plants. And I took a picture and that's that's what you see. Uh, the picture in the middle is one of those nine pictures of myself. I'm, I'm a little kid, you know, it's a self-portrait. The picture that is a little uh, next to it is a slum in Jakarta. And uh, the large picture is just a whole bunch. It's a stock picture of an enormous amount of people walking in one direction. Um, it, they, you know, I don't, I don't really, I'm not interested in, and sometimes I do. If I see this, I say, "Oh, I need the animal there, or something." I, I, I think uh, I, I like to mess with the order of the pictures so people can look at them one by one. When I did this show, um, I had a a an ex They're all photo objects. They're all three dimensional. They have several layers of paper. Uh, and one of them, one picture, this picture here, didn't have. It's called Nameless. You know, it's a it's a 19th century photograph uh, of a, an enslaved person by Alberto Henschel. It's a picture that she has illustrated many black heroes because that didn't have a face. So they always used her face as uh, the portrait of a woman that is very because it's because she has this fierce look, you know. But it's a uh, it's very ambiguous too because we once we we separate her from the hero that people are trying her to depict you she has a kind of a confusion in her eye it's a very enigmatic very powerful photograph but this one was flat this one wasn't a three-dimensional object and i love the fact that people look at it they say and they could swear it was like they, they has holes and had things on top of it so what i did for this show i did half flat and half, half the flat ones are additions and the, the the objects are unique works. So I made a, a show that has editions and unique works and they're mixed. So you get to see them one by one. And not as one group of works all in the same media. No. It's, it's and a, when it's I showed this in the back, I showed a, a, a series, a small series, like I did this time with the pictures of, with money. Uh, it mm -hmm. was called the Museum of Ashes. The, the National Museum in Brazil uh, was uh, completely destroyed by a fire and there were oh, archaeologists right. trying to save whatever they had there and they didn't have any funding because uh, you know it happened during the the you know the former government you know that the universities got defunded and they really needed money so uh, they, I worked with the people from the Catholic University that's right down the street from me and we we actually made works. There were 3D printing and also we, because that everywhere in the world, there will be uh, archaeologists, they find things and they bring it to the museum. There you had a team of archaeologists in the museum trying to find out what was left of the museum. And, um, and they needed like, uh, they, they had scans, but they needed to 3D print parts of it. They needed equipment. And uh, so I, with the sales from, they, they actually gave me the ashes. Well, for instance, an example, they had a, a, the oldest uh, skull of a human skull in the Americas was there. It's called Lucia, and it burned, you know, yeah. at least, uh, you know, two thirds of it. Uh, so they gave me the ashes of this person, you know, this woman that walked on there 14,000 years ago. Uh, and I made the piece, I made the skull again. And then I, and I, I drew it and wow. I photographed it very realistically. Uh, and uh, it was with the sale of these objects, we managed to fund the project of, uh, um, of, of reconstruction, but not reconstruction, but the, the help them find out, find what was left of things. Um, so and, very often the connection between the works and the events that inspired them and the cause you're helping um, is invisible to the viewer. We don't see any of that. All we yeah. see is the final. Oh, I, I, I make a point in, in, in mentioning it 
you know, if it's something that it's supposed to sell and, and generate um, funds. Uh, and, you want and, people to know. Yeah, I'm being very fortunate because um, people, normally these things come to me. You know, people will look, I am um, now working with the Innocence Project on a, on a very, very interesting uh, a project as well. I'm making portraits of the the, the exonerees, you know, the the, the uh, and uh, it's been so. I, I always have things like this happening, and then I, it's you know what I I've been working for almost forty years, and I've done things with garbage, with diamonds. I've done things big like that. They had to be, they had to have retro diggers make it and photograph it with helicopters. I've done tiny things like I did with MIT. They were had to be photographed with an electron microscope, but the, the the real material is experience. You know, you just have to be open and interact with the world in a way that is is always new and unexpected. And uh, I've been, I have a wonderful life. You know, in when it, it comes to the range of uh, experiences that it I was open to and it came to me. You know, being able to meet people who were uh, behind bars for you know twenty years for things that the crimes they did not commit, it's a it's a fascinating thing. It's, I mean it's it, it's it's a bad thing, but it's a it you know sharing experience, understanding how you know this happens, being exposed to uh, you know three years in a, in a largest garbage dump in Brazil or, or things like that. Sometimes you know they are. Uh, very important, you know, for me as an artist, uh, and, and I continue. They feed my work. Mm -hmm. I work in refugee camps too. Uh, I I work with a, a friend of mine, Max Fieder, who is who is a, a he has a um, an NGO called Art Solution, and he does um, art centers in refugee camps. And we've been wow, in, fantastic along Balukali in Bangladesh. I think uh, I do this as a person. I'm not as an artist. I mean, but many, many times we find we end up discovering ways in which the artist and the citizen, the person, sort of like uh, work together, and uh, you know, end up uh, the the results are always really, really good. I'm very happy with most of what we've done so far. Yeah, and it seems like you're gradually always working your way towards a kind of a parity. Like a like a equality, uh, balancing the scales a little more between people that would never have this exposure or have this experience or or this share this knowledge with you, and then people for whom art is something you can take for granted. It's just something they've always known. They were raised with. It's 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 part of leading a comfortable life. I think that you know I'm not a, a somebody who very good at balancing things but i if if there is a, a balance mm -hmm. is exactly this i mean people it's bringing art to people who hasn't seen it and actually showing what what it can do for people who are tired of looking at it and not uh, you know probably a little um you know sedated by the 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 access that most of us have to to images and to artworks I am a, a serious uh, believer in what art can do, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I and I think, uh, and I am a I'm eternal optimist, you know. I think you have to have uh, some kind of. Uh, I am really uh, recently, you know. I saw uh, we we go to I've been to the movies with Malu a few times here in New York, and uh, I, we were mentioning, you know, I miss Utopian. Uh, uh, movies. I mean, it's, <laughs> everything is dystopic, and it's like, oh God, this is it's just it's not good for your brain, you know. Um, I think you have to, at least, uh, if everybody does a little bit, at least, you know, if you, you have to believe that something can be better, you know. The bison, uh, the the pictures with money, um, you know, they came. Uh, after the similar exhibition in Brazil, I was uh, paper money is something that nobody takes from you anymore. My father used to carry a huge amount of bills because it was a uh, was a lot of inflation when I was a kid, right. and uh, and I thought it was so beautiful. You know, it was like a brick of bills, and 
I always like to look at money, not just as beautifully printed. Uh, it's uh, what is that you put on money reflects a lot of what you, you how you work as a society. So I, I kept thinking in Brazil, uh, my daughter, she used to get money from my table here. And she said, oh, I got money from your table to play. And I said, what kind of money? Because I we have reais, the Brazilian reais, always bring it and drop it here. And we have uh, uh, dollars, you know. And then she said, oh, I got animal money because Brazil has animals in it, in, mm -hmm. in money, you know. And, and I said, what about the other money? What is it? She said, it's old people's money because dollars always have some old dude in it. And I can think <laughs> a lot about it. Um, when I went to visit the the mint in Brazil, where they make money, mm -hmm. they shred the money that is is not printed, uh, has little mistakes. And then they said, if I wanted it, I thought they were gonna give me like a box of it, but they gave me bags and bags. And I started making these uh, landscapes with Brazilian money. Um, I think we had one in the back. Uh, can we go back? Uh, yeah, right there. That one. Yeah. That's... The, the thing is, uh, Brazilian money doesn't have any green bills. You know, the, they had one of one real and they took it out of circulation. <laughs> Everything that you see that is green comes from a number on the 20 reais bill. Sure. I made these landscapes because, you know, you don't really think about money is made out of paper. You had to cut a tree to make paper. Uh, you know, people don't, it goes back to the micro mosaics that I was talking before, you know, they feel a lot of people when they draw a tree, they do not realize that they're drawing a tree with another tree. You know, the pencil that's in the hands used to be alive and used to grow. The charcoal that's in it also used to be a tree and the paper in which they're drawing, drawing it was also a tree. Uh, I I think a lot about those things. That's why I mix materials and images the way I do. When I I thought about making these um, uh, images out of money, the first thing that came to me was nature. You know, because I'm, I'm also involved in in environmental uh, pro projects here in Brazil. And then I thought, this is it. You know, you just make a picture out of money that used to be. Uh, trees and things that I mean, it's enough for people to just to mess out try to figure out you know what came first the, the egg or, or the chicken you know I like to create that kind of ambiguity in images uh, I think it encourages people to think about what's uh, mm -hmm. what they're thinking the, I did the trees but um, and then uh, Meg from the gallery said oh aren't you going to do can we show them I said oh money is local you know, it's like when they started making, stop, started making uh, talkies, you know, in film, they mm -hmm. had to open offices and they, it's, it's a more, it's it just, a, it speaks to a group of people, of individuals. But then I thought dollars is speak to a much wider uh, audience because it's used everywhere in the world. Right. But who would I, wh what would I do? Landscapes? I said, there's a lot of green, it would be great. But then I, I thought, you know, the, the 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 Tubman thing that Obama asked that Harriet Tubman would be on the $20 bill instead of Andrew Jackson. I thought that would be such a great idea, a wonderful idea, you know. And then when Trump became president, I think uh, uh, the secretary of treasury, they, they, Stephen Mnuchin. they alleged that they had uh, um, uh, technical difficulties, you know. Technical difficulties, that's how they call racism these days, you know, <laughs> putting a black person on a, on a bill. Uh, I, I think uh, I, it was so hideous, the whole thing, you know. And, and it ties back to the art world because the te secretary of the treasury at the time was the son of one of the most powerful art dealers in New York City, if not the world. See, yeah. So then I thought, well, if you cannot put her in money, let's make her out of money. And I think that was the first portrait I did. And it's the last one you see in the show because I didn't want to uh, see. But then you start making one portrait, start thinking about it, you know. And then there are no women. Eleanor Roosevelt was in a bill, uh, in a commemorative bill. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there was no Indian chief ever, uh, uh, you know, that came where was in a, there was only also in a commemorative bill. 
I thought of sitting bull uh, from the Curtis picture to be the one, but then he, I got a problem with him. Curtis? With, no, with sitting bull because sitting uh, bull. He, he was on a uh, uh, Buffalo Bill circus, you know, and then uh, every time I see a picture of him, it looks like I'm seeing a picture of somebody in a circus. Show. Yeah. Right. But uh, American Horse has this like a sad look in his face, but uh, beautiful at the same time. You look at this. I love this picture because he's looking at the future somehow. And it's a it. And I thought it would be amazing. You know, they, they should put that into money. You know, if we were to really uh, show what's important for us to know. You know? I think it would be great if your portrait of him was made into money. Yeah. <laughs> so it'd be money on top of money. <laughs> oh, maybe one day. Maybe uh, one day. A bison would be interesting because uh, they, they've been animals. Well, and, I still, uh, I carry a buffalo, a bison nickel with me everywhere for good luck. You know, the old five cent pieces? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Oh, I have, a, I carry a $2 bill with me. <laughs> the same thing. Yeah, for the luck. same for the same reason. <laughs> yeah, I am, I am silly like that. Hey, you know, I hate to say it, but I think we're getting close to question and answer time, Vic, because, um, I mean, I could just go on like this for a long time, but it would be selfish. Um, but it's it's great talking to you one on one. Um, I'll be back. But meanwhile, I think Eleanor has actually um, pinned down a few people who have some good questions. Yes, thank you, Dan. And thank you so, so much, Vic, for those amazing insights into your practice and these works. It's been an absolutely brilliant conversation. I'm so grateful to both of you. Um, we do have some questions here from the audience. And our first question today will be from GE. If you want to unmute GE, go ahead. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, Vic. Question is, do you feel the power of your work is that you never really felt comfortable working with traditions of abstraction? Um, yeah, I did. I think um, wh what I did, um, I don't trust my own. I, I, I have a hard time being comfortable with, for instance, color. It's something that appeared in my work much later. You know, I, sometimes I, use, I wear black because I'm afraid to make mistakes and how am I going to be dressed? <laughs> <laughs> but I I did something. Um, I when I started working with uh, paper, you know, one of the things that I came here at the studio one day, and uh, I started I, when I got the printer. You know, I realized that I could start working with this layered way. I at first I need I felt I need that I need to I need to build a vocabulary again of how to work what the real paper, where the real paper was, where it was an image of real paper. And I relied heavily on this guest out kind of uh, 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 practice. You know, it was not just, so I was thinking about groups, uh, um, object of permanence, um, and, and then obviously abstraction starts seeping in slowly. First of all, and I don't trust my compositional uh, knowledge or, or schemes where I didn't trust them. So I borrowed from uh, existing artists. So I, I went into Arthur Dove and, and many, many, especially early American abstraction, because I'm really fond of it. Um, and the uh, Italian painting from the 1950s, um, and I did a whole exhibition that was based on, on abstraction, but then it, they're not abstract because they're pictures of things. They're pictures of, once you photograph something, it's not abstract anymore. It's a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> and that's what I liked about it because there is this metaphysical element to it, you know? And I called um, this show, I, I named it uh, Epistems. Because of uh, there were there were little units of, of of knowledge that was kind of like you had to deal with it. I did a, a work uh, in the uh, in the early nineties. You know, they had like a, a, they were plasticine. I came back from Europe. The only thing I found in my old studio was a ball of plasticine, and I had a camera. So what I did, I made a sculpture. I set up a rule: it cannot be geometric, cannot be organic. 
And I took a picture and I had only one ball plastic. So I take it back, I did another one. And I took up and I did 54 of these and it was my last show at Stux Gallery. Basically, you're looking at 54 pictures of the same thing, but in different forms, you know. Uh, that is like, a, I started thinking about a picture of a thing cannot be abstract. It exists there. It's a, it's a, it's, it is, abstraction is a very, very hard thing. It's just like meditation. Very hard thing to come across something truly abstract because we're always like uh, having these uh, pictures coming together. But I, I normally, when I deal with abstraction, I deal uh, with things that I love, that I admire a lot in abstract painting, especially because it's something that it excites me, especially, especially because I deal, always dealing with meaning in some form. Once you, you they're always challenging you know, in terms of how you see and perceive them. But I've I've done, uh, I, right now, I am just working, sometimes you feel patches of old series. I'm doing a work of, of a Brazilian painter named Tomi Otaki, great abstraction, sure. abstract painting, painter with pigments and fragments, doing this mosaic thing that I was talking about. But I, it comes and goes. I mean, I, I've done... Uh, uh, another concurrent series uh, exhibition that I did with uh, Scraps, I did it one called uh, Photocubismo, which was about cubism is this thing that is it, it challenges the way you look at things. And I did a whole series based on cubist paintings, painter. But the, but I have I, in in this I have a book. It's called Epistems. It's, it's at the gallery actually. If you look for it, there's a, a most of it is abstract. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, G. Thank you, G, for that question. Um, the next question will be from Ezra. And Ezra, I will give you the ability to unmute. Oh, you need to unmute, Ezra. There we go. So I clicked one button that said unmute, but not the second. Uh sorry. Uh <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot. I've, I've you know I've, I've looked at your work for many years and enjoyed it. Um, and uh, I was teaching uh, teaching students your work this this fall, and uh, using that book Plastic Capitalism, and uh, it got me to actually go on to Instagram and look at the the Catador Tiao, uh, and uh, it was kind of a this interesting thing in class about. Um, it was interesting for me and generationally i thought am i a 21st the 20th century relic wandering through the 21st century and i i wondered you know if that visual flow of instagram and somehow if it is more alive in some way today than gallery spaces to us to be honest or or not i, I don't i'm curious what you think of that no i used to right now i'm not i have a lap uh, a tabletop computer i'm not going to turn it but i have space in front of me before I used to have a studio here on, on uh, number 13, Lexington Avenue in Brooklyn, and I had a wall. And I, I am one of these people, when I travel, I picked up all the magazines that I could afford, and, and then I would just read pages, and then I would, like, you know, in crime scene movies that they put, like, <laughs> how they connect. People, I used to have God this alive. wall, but this wall was so disconnected and crazy and insane, because they, they weren't things that would go together, and I liked that, too. And then I know people, they came to see my studio and they always go, can we see the wall? Because the wall would change, you know. It, it, and um, recently, I don't have a wall anymore in any studio. I always have a table in the middle and I missed it. And then it was about 13 years ago, I was at uh, Davos in, in Switzerland and I ran into JR, the artist, you know. And then he said, do you have Instagram? <laughs> I said, what's Instagram? And he put it on the on my phone for me. And we took a selfie. And, and I, I looked at it, I was like, I don't know about this. And I uh, didn't pay much attention. But gradually, it became my wall. You know, ah. I, I kept looking at these things. And obviously, I am, I don't discriminate at all. Uh, I see all types of images. I, I, for, I love Kung Fu films, you know, I love, uh, I like, uh, you know, I like uh, illuminations, you know, like pick, hand, early, uh, I, I can, I can, it will be, we need to do another 
two hours of this to tell you what I like. You know, it's easier to say and I, what I. There's not much I don't like when it comes to <laughs> image looking. I am a bit of a junkie, you know, and uh, and image I love junkie. memes and I like stupid videos. Um, and I, the moment you start interacting with it, you know, it it becomes like addictive, you know, and I have to control myself. But I, I, for instance, do not put my own work on Instagram. Rarely, I may, may invite people to come to a show. You know, I put mostly in stories, like because I don't think it. You know, you cannot uh, see art on this. I thought one. This is a dream. This is like the 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 book of sand by Borges. You know, like that you think you would <laughs> be, have access the Aleph that you have access to everything at once. You know, as a kid, I dreamed of this thing. You know, but I didn't, could not possibly imagine that would bring so much trouble with it. It's like a Pandora box, you know. But um, for that same reason, I think uh, the reason we were in extreme deficit with our idea of reality, you know, I think art has never been more more important. Uh, in these shows that are in the gallery right now, that it is impossible to see it if you're not there. Making art that only exists uh, by presence, you know, by being presentially is very important it, because um, we are bombarded by images constantly. Everywhere we look, we see something. You see a screen, you see uh, something being told to us, you know. And then one day of the week, maybe a Saturday, you wake up, you shower, you take a, a Uber, and then you go to a museum and you go in the direction of an image of your choice. It's a conscious thing. It's like uh, the idea of your being somewhat in control of a, of a visual ritual. It's a, I don't think there's anything more important nowadays than this. The, you, you being, um, you know, you, you controlling this. Um, I remember that Salvador Dali once went to the zoo to draw a, a hippopotamus, no, a rhinoceros, right? I think that's so cool. <laughs> Once I did, no, I woke up one day, you know, and I, I, I said, I'm gonna do this. I'm just gonna go to the zoo and draw the rhinoceros, and I did. And it was for me as an artist was so such a significant thing, you know. But it's a, it's great when you wake up and and you want to see Christina's world at MoMA, you know. I do that often. I said, I want to see that painting today, and I just go. I, I. And there's no way you see it. If I see it on my phone, it's not the same. You know, you can, can look very closely the way, you know, the brush strokes and things that are impossible to see otherwise. So I'm I'm really, really into making art that it makes no sense on a screen. Um, it, it Because it makes perfect sense to be made to be in a gallery. I mean, I, I, I am a... And it's funny because uh, these are photo objects that I re-photograph six, seven times to get. So I have piles and piles. That's why scraps come from. I have piles of paper. Sometimes to make one image, I have to shoot it five, six times. And then, um, uh, you know, my my gallerist said to me, before you used to make one picture and I used to sell six of them. Now you make six and we only get to see it once, sell it once. <laughs> so it's bad for business <laughs> but i think uh that's the way we're going one way or another but i i you know to answer your question i think uh um, it's the job of an artist to be constantly involved with the with the visual environment uh in, in any any possible way you know if you lose and if you let go you lose relevance you know but i i still like to see art physically, presentially, it's something that for me is what counts the most. Thank you so much for that question, Ezra. And thank you, Vic, for that super generous answer. Um, we did receive a lot of really great questions today, but for time, I'm going to turn it over to Fong for our final question um, of the Q&A. And I just want to thank you all so much for your great questions. And thank you again, Vic and Dan. Um, and and I should apologize for my generous answers because it could <laughs> get along. No, no, it's, it's so great. <laughs> I'm not a synthetic kind of person. <laughs> it makes my job so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. But 
uh, Dan, uh, it's super delightful to hear you talk. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you, Fong. Yeah, it's just great when you know we get excited about things. It's all it's all about that enthusiasm for life, anyway. But you know, thinking back in 1989. Several things that I remember seeing, um, in addition to Jenny Hosa, great, great installation at the Guggenheim. Mm -hmm. I saw your show at Stuck's Gallery. Oh, in fact, not only I remember that show, I bought the catalog that's written by our friend Joshua Decker. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so it stayed with me for the longest time, you know. And in you just say yourself, actually, the last thing you say, I, I'm a synthetic person. <laughs> uh, maybe so, but I think you are also equally analytical. Uh, I tell you why. Because, because this is a very interesting uh, approach to, to look at your work. Um, you know, when you think about synthetic and cubic, uh, analytical cubism, Somehow it referred back to the beginning, Cezanne, obviously. And and the idea of how once we think about who would be the heir directly when Cezanne died in 1906, you know, and took a while for people to, to figure out which part of Cezanne they wanted to be absorbed and materialize and transform that spirit into their own work. So I always felt like maybe too, you know, Dan, uh, I thought maybe Giacometti will represent the anxious side of Cezanne. Why Morandi would undertake the, the side of serenity, the common side of Cezanne. So going to, to you in, in some ways, I felt why easily reading your work can fall into the category of maximalist vision or whatever that means, you know, the bombardment of that synthetic uh, covering the surface and whatnot. But at the same time, I wonder when concrete poetry uh, came to Brazil in the early 50s, you know, we had a, a, an amazing birthday celebration on our Zoom, actually, it was the, two years ago uh, for Augusto de Campio, the campos, the campos yeah. night, 90th birthday we celebrate on this <laughs> with so many great poets friends around the world it was such an exciting day so thinking about linguistic element which is what concrete poetry is about in which typographical physiognomy or appearances is more important in conveying the meaning rather than just verbal significance so I was thinking whether that ever came to your thinking conceptually from the beginning, concrete poetry. Uh, you know, it did. To a lot of uh, people my age, they were living in the, especially, I mean, I would say concrete poetry, poetry has its beginnings in the late, mid to late 50s, but it became very, uh, um, important in the mid 60s on after the the you know the the dictatorship the you know yeah. um, you know when you were a young person with intellectual ambitions ambitions uh, in Brazil at that time uh, it was uh, interesting to know the codes you know you nothing is during a military dictatorship nothing is you cannot say what you want to say Mm -hmm. uh, everything that is said that is important comes coded somehow. Yep. So you get a, a song by Chico Buarque that talks about being uh, a, watching a band go by. You know, he's talking about a military band. So if yeah. it, knowing uh, being a, a on the flow on the know of what people were saying was that what they find an intellectual in my you know young. In my teenage years, and that was important to be there. And I think, uh, you know, concrete poetry plays a huge role on that mm -hmm. because it was a way also to codify language in ways that people would know. Um, there was a, a one particular poet, Leminski, you know, that was uh, from Rio Grande do Sul. The mm -hmm. concrete were more structural, they were like uh, uh, really thinking 
you know, I, I had the Galaxy's book, the book that has no punctuation in it. It's a huge, it, it, it informed a generation of artists, especially the people who were the R uh, uh, references like Caetano Veloso, uh, Chico Buarque, the mainly mm -hmm. musicians, you know, they were from the first wave of concrete poetry. But yeah. for me, it's more, it was more on the 60s that had become relevant. And I think, uh, you know, what, if there is a connection, um, I've heard this phrase uh, by the, the director of the Senate in Brazil. Uh, they said that politics is the art of the possible, you know. Mm -hmm. I love that because it's, yeah. it's like it, it simplifies a lot of uh, things when you come to think of it. And yeah. I think uh, uh, it was always negotiation, you know, between yeah. the form and content, between the textural elements of it and what they come to signify. And yeah. I think uh, I... I that duality, you know, it's very present in my work. Whatever you think, whatever it is, uh, it is, uh, I, 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 that is something that it's present in almost every piece that I do. There yeah. is always, um, I, and I take it, you know, uh, it's funny because my for, for formation as a, as a, as an artist, I never had a, a, an art class in my life. But I, um, I keep thinking that if uh, if I take like models, uh, the models for of being of operation, but working as an artist, mm. there's, a, there's a piece at, at the, I saw at the Hamburger Bahnhof in, in Berlin that it was beautiful. It was a a dollar bill signed one side by Warhol, the other side by Joseph Beuys. Mm -hmm. I, I I have to say that Warhol is. Well, huge influence. I, although it doesn't seem so, I am very influenced by minimalism. The mm -hmm. art that was made during the periods that I was thinking uh, of mm -hmm. my relationship mm -hmm. to the world, minimalism and pop is, are very much there. Minimalism because it has this uh, impossible thing between material and idea. That is the poetics is how these things get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, that's how how I see it. But pop, it's like the way Warhol worked in the, in the he was always getting from the, the most commonplace of, of the visual. He was harvesting whatever mm -hmm. people were seeing yeah. And, yeah, and dealing with. I thought that is not only generous to when, when you produce it, you produce it to an audience that it's not going to be, uh, you know, it, it, they're not the images that you have to learn anything mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. them. they're part of your universe they, and i think i think that is is it's a very not only very smart but also very generous from from the artist's perspective and the other is boys with its relationship to myth mm -hmm. and practice and the idea of dealing directly with things material you know when you when i i, I think of uh, uh an art can, can be as conceptual and as physical. Every mm -hmm. time I walk in Chelsea and I see the, the the oaks and the stones, I think about it. And it's been, he is perhaps one of the biggest influences for me. And I, and I but I, I think it's something in the middle. Um, when you look at a painting, you know, you go like this and like this, and you see uh, a picture that is, uh, when you are far from it, you see a, a, an image that it's, uh, it's comes from somebody's mind. Yeah, when you're close to it, you see what's made of. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and the fact that you go back and forth, you want to be see, you want to feel exactly when material becomes matter becomes idea. You know, when, yeah. when that little moment where a figment, part of the world becomes a part of what you have inside your head. Yeah, and I, I I I live for these moments. You know, when I make art, I just I love the fact that you can. It's that moment where you negotiate, like as I said, it's, it's a pol political moment. It's an art of the possible. These two things connect. They negotiate, yeah. you negotiate that little uh, ambiguous, shallow surface gets to be, uh, you know, represent the entire universe at that particular moment. I And I I, I think, uh, you know, there's a, an, an enormous array of influence, of influences uh, that come from, Brazil and definitely, uh, you know, concrete poetry is one of them. But yeah. it is—I I don't think it would come uh, um, 
even if subliminally, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. other people my age, you know, because we, no. we were crazy about it. Yeah, uh, I remember uh, meeting John Updike pretty wow. much right after he wrote uh, the review of Warhol retrospective of MoMA in the summer of 1993. I have met him a few months prior through my late friend, the legendary publisher, George Bazilla. So we were very friendly. And he revealed the Warhol show with the title saying, Fast Art for Busy Manhattanite. I was, actually, <laughs> I was telling Charlie, our managing editor this morning, what he forgot, however, when I asked him, but have you spent time to watch Warhol films, sir? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, they, were, they are very long. They're the opposite, six, seven hour long. And I think that's exactly the poetic nature of Warhol that we don't get to see that easily, which is why talking to a lot of people, a lot of our friends who came from elsewhere, whether Serena Sa, Shoja Azari, yourself, and myself also seeing it in the same way, is that we have to be political through what we say and what we write. So it's interesting about esoteric writing is that you write between the lines. It's the opposite of exoteric, which is outward, you know? Yeah. Um, I think you just, you happen to have both. And I appreciate that too. Even that, our friend Dan, he started out working for our late friend, the poet John Ashbury for several years before entering into writing criticism. So poetry is essential to our lives. So thank you, Vit. Can't wait to see the thank show you. tomorrow. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dan. Back to you, Eleanor. Thank you, Fong. Thank you so much, Fong. Um, and a huge thanks once again to you, Vic and Dan. This has been a really delightful afternoon. Um, and I would also like to extend my gratitude to Monica and Meg from Sycama Jenkins & Co. for helping us to uh, prepare for today. And a huge thanks as well to Erica from Vic Studio for supporting us so much as well. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NFC and making these daily conversations possible. Um, and you can also, they also support our archive, which you can explore on the Rails YouTube channel. Um, and this conversation will be posted there shortly. The rail has been free and independent for 23 years. Uh, please consider a donation to the rail to support our work and support our writers, production staff, and operations. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Guadalupe Maravilla and Eugenie Tsai on Maravilla's exhibition, Sino Sanas Hoy, Sanadas Mañana, on view at PPOW. Thank you so, so much again, Dan and Vic. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. And you can turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you. Thank you so thanks, much everybody. Again. Thanks, thanks you, Vic. Thanks, Eleanor. Thank, thank, thank you, Vic. Everyone. Thanks, Vic. Thank Take care. Bye. Thank you, Vic. Bye, 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 Chloe. Bye, congratulations. Bye, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.